pleasure to welcome all of you for the ACR 2023 um, uh, Grappa Virtual Congress highlights on psoriatic diseases. And we have a really packed program for today. We have a brilliant um, faculty with us today, and we want to kindly, um, heartily welcome every one of you that made it to the um, um, live attendance today or that are going to watch the highlights on demand later on. So my name is Fabian Proft. I'm a rheumatologist working at the Charité University Hospital in Berlin. And it is a real pleasure to uh, also introduce my brilliant co-host Lourdes um, Paris Chada from Howard Medical School in Boston, the US. And uh, Lourdes, pleasure having you here on my side again and yeah, just to work on the whole concept together with you for such a time now. And for all of you that are familiar with the program, we have um, uh, three sections. We divided the uh, highlights from ACR, the big American rheumatology conference that just took place in San Diego a couple of weeks ago into basic science, clinical topics, and um, new treatment modalities on um, psoriatic disease, and this time uh, mainly psoriatic arthritis. And um, the presentations were um, pre prepared by Jan Grappian, so the rising stars within the Grappa community, mm -hmm. and they were supported by some of the senior Grappa members, some of the heroes and pillars from um, the Grappa history, and we are really yeah, looking forward to hear your presentations. And, but what is also really important, because we would like to have an interactive discussion, so if you have any questions for the presentations giving, you can use the Q&A field in the chat box, or you are um, also asking your questions in the chat, and then we will try to address your questions. And um, this would be really important to have this as well. So here are our disclosures, which did not have any influence on the current um, program today. And without any further ado, I will just give you a short um, introduction about the agenda. Um, First, we will start about the basic science, and I'm really happy to have Rafael Micaroli from Switzerland, Zurich here, um, presenting on the basic science, and he was supervised by Christopher Richland. Um, then we will go over to the clinical topics that will be presented by Andre Ribeiro, who was supervised by Daphne Gladman when preparing the slides, and then Zeni Starra will um, finish up the cherry on the cake with the treatment highlights and was supported by Enrico Soriano when presenting, uh, preparing the slides. And then we will have some time for the panel discussion and Q&A. We will have short Q&A after each uh, section and we'll try to address the burning questions that you might have or comments that you might have. And in the end, we will try to bring this all together and have the uh, panel discussion, and we hope that you will stay tuned. And without any further ado, um, I only want to like uh, also to um, uh, kindly um, yeah, welcome our PRP patient research partner, Chris Lindsay, will support us and will try to also um, yeah, contribute with a patient perspective on the presented abstracts. And we're really happy having you here, um, Chris. Uh, yeah. Real pleasure to have you here. And so I think we are ready to start. Um, buckle up and then we are going uh, to attend the presentation on basic science by Rafael Micaroli. And yeah, Rafael, the stage is yours. It's such a pleasure having you here with your expertise and um, hearing the first-hand expert, uh, uh, insights about basic science from ACR 2023. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to be here and present the basic science highlights. So we can go one further. These are our disclosures. We have no relevant to this presentation. Please go again one forward. So when I looked through all the basic research abstracts, I found three which stood out for me and three of which I was able to build a, a little story. So to go from top to bottom, so from skin to joint, and then even deeper into some specific cells. So first I would like to present an abstract which shows some differences in PTO and psoriatic arthritis, then go on to show cells migrating from skin to the joint, and last but not least show some differences between psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, synovial fibroblasts. So first, the abstract upregulation of rank ligand in the skin of patients with psoriatic arthritis was presented by Maria de la Luz Garcia Hernandez of the group of Chris Richlin. And they have a deep background in studying synovitis in the psoriatic arthritis and especially uh, studying osteoblasts, osteoclasts and uh, the role of rank ligand 
in synovitis of psoriatic arthritis. So they saw that rank ligand is heavily upregulated in psoriatic arthritis synovitis, and rank ligand is known to promote differentiation of osteoclast precursors into osteoclasts, and especially in osteoclast precursors expressing DC stamp. And they looked a bit deeper, also looked in, in bone marrow and in blood in, from patients with psoriasis and saw that this DC stamp and dritic cell transmembrane protein expressing osteoclast precursors are actually the same regarding bone marrow, comparing healthy controls and psoriasis, but they differ in blood. So this in mind, it was really the question for this group, where do the additional osteoclast well, There is not a, a production of osteoclast precursors, so there is maybe an additional source of it. So they asked themselves, do events in the skin actually trigger the differentiation of monocytes to osteoclast precursors? We can go forward. And they took biopsies, skin biopsies from patients with psoriasis and patients with psoriatic arthritis. They took lesional and non-lesional skin, skin biopsies and uh, used immune fluorescence in order to detect the percentage of cells expressing rank ligand or CD14 positive DC stem um, expressing cells. And they saw for both that in lesional psoriatic arthritis skin, it was upregulated, so there was a higher frequency of those cells compared to psoriasis lesional skin and for sure also compared to non-lesional in both groups. Furthermore, if you look at the pictures on the bottom, you see that for rank ligand, which is red, in psoriatic arthritis lesional skin, it is mainly located in the epidermis, meaning probably mostly expressed by keratinocytes. We can go to the next. And this next step, they ask themselves, well, why is this upregulated in the epidermis? Is this promoted by um, some cytokines within the dermis or are there additional factors? It's known that the interleukin-17 is upregulated in the skin, but TNF is mainly absent. But they saw that TNF alpha is upregulated in the blood, in the serum of psoriatic arthritis patients. So they did this very nice Western blood analysis using keratinocytes and simulated those cells with either TNF alone, interleukin-17 alone, or combination of TNF plus interleukin-17. And they, they saw that rank ligand was only present if both TNF plus interleukin-17 was added. So it seems that this epidermal expression of rank ligand was promoted by interleukin-17 coming from the skin itself, but in addition from TNF alpha in the serum, which was only present in psoriatic arthritis. Then please to the next slide. So this was then really a, a question of chicken and egg. So what was first? Was there first the, the, the synovitis producing TNF alpha and promoting a rank ligand expression, or was there first the rank ligand expression leading to more severe uh, synovitis? And they did this very nice experiment in grafting uh, immune compromised mice with either non-lesional or lesional skin of psoriatic arthritis patients. They waited for several days, added some mechanical stimulus, so they let them run for several days and then took uh, knee biopsies and stained for CD45 in order to detect hematopoietic cells. And they saw actually that hematopoietic cells were present in those mice which were engrafted with the lesional skin. So it seems for some part that these cells are, are spreading or migrating or lead to a, an overexpression of those cells in the synovium. We can go forward. So they concluded that the infiltration of this stem CD14 positive osteoclast precursor was found exclusively in theoretic arthritis skin not in PSO patients, then elevated systemic TNF levels in PSA coupled with interleukin-17 enhanced rank ligand protein expression by keratinocytes and rank ligand expression by monocytes and keratinocytes in PSA plugs 
probably leads to the priming of osteoclast precursors. Then to the next slide. So this question whether cells can migrate or not was also asked by another group, by the group of Andreas Ramming from Erlangen and especially by Gabriela. So the title of this article is Synodal Shaping of Skin-Derived Migrating Immune Cells Determines Initiation of Inflammation in Psoriatic Arthritis. And we all know, at least in adults, skin is first and later comes joint manifestations. And the question is, is there a skin joint axis which explains this partly? And they did really nice mice experiments. So they had two different mice models, um, a black six mice model and the bulb C mice model. The black six is the black mouse and the white one, the bulb C. And if you do an interleukin 23 overexpression in those two mice, both will get skin psoriasis, but only the white mouse will develop arthritis. And then they, in addition, used photoconvertible chloride transgenic mice, which is a very nice model because you can um, transform the cells from chloride green into chloride red applying UV light. So they applied UV light uh, on skin plugs, psoriatic skin plugs, so that all the cells in the skin plug uh, will transform to chloride red, and then followed these cells using light sheet fluorescence microscopy. And you see on the right side, even in the control group, so in both mice um, without interleukin 23 overexpression, you see the red dots, not only in the skin, but also in the subcutaneous tissue, and even more uh, when there is an interleukin 23 overexpression. So this is the first thing that actually these skin cells migrate. And then also really the question, what are those cells? And they did some uh, fantastic experiments using single cell RNA-seq and different packages using also proteomics. And finally, um, identified those cells as CD4 positive MHC2, uh, MHC class two positive monocytes. And more interestingly, the, the initial cell or the migrating cell was the same in, in mice with and without arthritis. So then the next question is, what leads to synovitis in, in those mice? What is the difference? We see we saw that the initial cell migrating from skin to synovium is the same. So what causes arthritis? And they looked again into single cell RNA-seq data from the synovium and used then a, a package called CellChat, where you can test for interactions between different cell types. And so there is a really strong interaction between the red macrophages, so coming from the skin, with sublining fibroblasts. Further analysis um, showed that these sublining fibroblasts are mostly the CD200 positive or periostin positive synovial fibroblasts, which are have most likely a protecting role in synovium. So in the mice not getting arthritis, the fibroblasts protect um, that the monocytes migrating from the skin um, differentiate into a pro-inflammatory macrophage. We can go further. So they concluded that the skin joint axis actually exist, exists. And then that the interleukin 23 overexpression induces migration of the immune cells. And in both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis mice, but this is not enough. So there needs to be an interaction with synovial fibroblasts in order to promote actual inflammation. We can go on. Then really leading up to this is what are actual differences of synovial fibroblasts between different diseases? So are they all the same or um, are they different? And the group from uh, Dublin, um, under the lead of Ursula Fieren, looked into this. So they again used um, joint biopsies, respectively joint arthroscopy, uh, to get synovial fibroblasts um, in order to test if 
the Senegal fibroblasts differ between different inflammatory joint diseases. Go. Next. Next slide. So they sorted initially the Senegal fibroblasts using podoplanin as the marker and um, did a flow analysis uh, using different um, proteins and genes, and they saw that CD55 is upregulated psoriatic arthritis. CD55 is known as be, to be the, the, the key marker of the lining fibroblast, or the, the fibroblasts in direct contact to the joint cavity, and in contrast, more immune response regulative genes were upregulated in the RA and more um, associated with sublining fibroblast types. They also did additional analysis where they again saw that um, using Taiwan, which is CD19, um, is more present in, in RA and in comparison, Taiwan negative, uh, more in psoriatic arthritis. Again, Taiwan CD19 is always always absent in lining fibroblasts, again, concluding that psoriatic arthritis, at least in this study, is more abundant in psoriatic arthritis. They did additional analyzing, um, comparing lining fibroblasts to sublining fibroblasts, and concluding that lining uh, mostly uh, has the function of invasion, ECM regulation, in contrast to the sublining where immune response regulation, ECM cytoskeletal regulation is uh, permitted. The next slide. As next step, then, they put the Sinal fibroblasts into culture, and they wanted to know first if the, the function persists, if they put them in culture, and uh, secondly, if it vanishes after a certain passages. So they saw that at passage zero, so when they directly looked for, for different expressions, they saw that still uh, differences were um, observed. And also here as an example, more angiogenic mediators were expressed in psoriatic arthritis compared to RA. And this fits very nicely with, with other studies showing that um, angiogenesis is one of the key markers of cyanide psoriatic arthritis. But after several passages in culture, the cyanofibroblasts became more similar and similar. So that these differences disappeared. Next slide. So they concluded that our cyanofibroblasts are more relevant on immune response regulation, the ECM remodeling, and cellular proliferation, while PSA cyanofibroblasts are more relevant on the invasion, stimulation of angiogenesis. And culture over several passages led to the conversion of the PSA and RA synovial fibroblasts into a more similar phenotype. Next slide. So when we look at the initial questions, next slide. We can partly answer those with this. The so lesional skin in PSA is different compared um, PSA to PSO, then there are seem to be some migrating cells coming from the skin into the joint and cellular fibroblasts differ, but after culturing, the difference disappear. So this really leads to my conclusion that there needs to be always a cross-talking between different cell types. So there seems not to be only one cell type be important, but more a crosstalk. And mainly we think that is the monocytes talking to the cellular fibroblasts leading to some sort of initiation of the inflammation and um, further studies are needed for sure in every aspect. So thank you very much for your intention. And I want to close with this picture I made with Dali I'm monocycling on a journey to meet synovial fibroblasts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you for a really fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed the picture on the last slide. Um, 
I think that we are here also to have some expert discussion on it, but also want to in, uh, invite everyone um, just asking your questions. And maybe you can start. And do you see any clinical implications also from the um, skin biopsy? So would it be an option that in the near future we could uh, biopsy our PSO patients and then make a differentiation if this patient will develop um, uh, also joint symptoms in the near future because of the um, uh, skin biopsy results that we see? Or um, is this too optimistic from your perspective? Well, I think this would be one of the goals, or at least to know not only uh, which patient develops further uh, psoriatic arthritis, but also on how to treat them accordingly. So, um, I mean, there are a lot of, of other studies going on, taking biopsies, matched skin and joint in patients with psoriasis and arthralgia, and also with psoriatic arthritis uh, from skin and joint uh, in humans. We saw a lot of, of mice results. So it, it really needs to be proved that this is also the case in, in humans. But it would be, of course, very, very nice to treat them very early so that they don't even get psoriatic arthritis. I have a question, Fabian and Rafael. Yes, sure. Go Danny, ahead, Zeni. <laughs> so, yeah, that was fascinating. That, that was, those were great presentations. I missed a couple of those uh, abstracts. Um, I was wondering the rank ligand um, study and, and, and the rest of the studies almost seem to suggest that the site of initiation for psoriatic arthritis is the skin. Um, and I know we've thought of the enthesis also as the site of initiation. So is there any thoughts as to where does the disease really start? Um, and Or is there different types? So one that starts at the skin and then one that starts at the enthesis or the gut. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean... Um, when you look at some of, of the histology images from, from the study of, of Erlang and from Andreas Raming and Gabriela, you see that in mice, the inflammatory cells are not only in the joint, but also surrounding the Achilles tendon. So they, the, the whole analysis was probably more of joint and of the um, enthesis um, of the ankle. And I mean, this is our hypothesis. I think the data on enthesitis is, is very scarce and, and we have already no knowledge on what's going on there on a molecular um, um, type. Um, but yeah, for sure, it, it, is, it is open. I, th I think that the most of us that are really focusing in this area do think that given that psoriasis occurs before arthritis in the vast majority of people, that the key, the seminal pathophysiologic events, we think, begin in the skin. Now, the abstract, by the way, that was beautifully presented, Raphael. All of the, these are complicated abstracts, and you did a great job. But Thank I you. would say that the challenge <clears throat> with the monocyte, the second abstract, is that you know these are mouse models and we do we use mice as well as you saw in our first abstract uh, but uh the idea that the monocytes are being generated in the skin and moving to the joints really needs to be replicated in in humans because most of the data we've seen so far in humans would indicate that it's mainly a t cell driven response we know that t, t cells cd8 cells are critical in the in the psoriasis in development of psoriasis. We know that they're very important in the joints as well from a number of different laboratories. So I really think that the key element now, we are all doing this, is trying to figure out whether there's oligoclonality of the T cells that are shared in the skin and the joints of patients with PSA. Um, I also am very interested in the monocytes. I think they play a key role in the development of the arthritis, but I would be surprised if they're the cells moving from the skin driving the arthritis. But uh, we've been surprised before, so we'll have to see. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you so much for that discussion. We will have more time later at the end if we want to resume this topic, but um, we, we're going to move on now to the next topic of clinical topics. And um, so if you have further questions on that section, please take note of those and we'll come back to that at the end. Uh, thank you for, for the wonderful presentation, Rafael, and uh, for your support, Chris. Um, thank you very so much. In the next section, we're going to be talking about clinical topics. And this will be presented by Andrea Ribeiro, 
who is a rheumatologist working at the Women's College Hospital as a fellow at the University of Toronto. And he has been supervised by Dr. Daphna Gladman, who is a rheumatologist professor uh, at the Toronto Western University. So uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to present the clinical highlights. These are our disclosures. Next. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with an abstract that was presented by Dr. Rodrigo Salinas. Uh, it focused on the progression of psoriasis to psoriatic arthritis, which is a current hot topic, and how arthralgia and ultrasound may be able to predict this. Next. They had a prospective cohort of 1,419 patients with arthralgia that presented to the Roma Check program which is kind of a fast track referral access for patients with suspected inflammatory arthritis. And they categorized patients as arthralgia at risk of progression if they had arthralgia plus psoriasis or arthralgia plus family history or both. So from that initial cohort, 8.4% or 119 patients developed PSA. Uh, sorry, were categorized as IARP PSA, and of those, 34 developed PSA at one year. Next. These are the initial baseline characteristics, the, the population and the univariate analysis. It's a very busy slide, but just focusing on, on the red brackets. So the mean age was around 48. There was a predominance of females around 78 and 61% in each group. The patients that did not develop PSA had a, a more prevalent history of family psoriasis. And the patients that developed PSA at one year had a longer disease duration of 15 years versus three years. In this particular abstract, there was no influence of CRP levels at baseline. And regarding imaging findings, patients that had bone erosions at baseline had higher chance of progressing to PSA, which might indicate prevalent case bias as undiagnosed PSA patients being inadvertently included in the sample. I don't know. And also patients that had ultrasound findings such as subclinical synovitis or subclinical enthesitis also had a higher chance of progressing to PSA. Next. As for the multivariate analysis, uh, higher tender joint count was slightly protective. And as I mentioned before, patients with sonographic enthesitis had a higher chance of progressing to PSA with an odds ratio of 470. Also, patients with synovitis had, and with family history of PSA had a higher chance of progressing to PSA with an odds ratio of around 30. Next. So in conclusion, this abstract found that arthralgia characterizes a high risk of developing PSA, especially if combined with a family history of PSA and with a longer disease duration. In addition, sonographic subclinical inflammation, including both synovitis and enthesitis, are also associated with a risk of progression to PSA at one year. Next. The second abstract, was presented by Dr. Eder and also focused on the progression of psoriasis to PSA, but in this case, analyzing the predicted value of high sensitivity CRP. Next. It was a prospective cohort of 589 psoriasis patients that were followed for a mean time of 7.5 years. And in this period, 57 patients developed PSA. Next. As the baseline characteristics, we can see a similar age to the previous abstract, around 48 years. In this case, there was a slight male predominance of about 60%. Duration of psoriasis was around 16 years, and the mean HSCRP at baseline was 3.1. Next. So in baseline, there were some groups that, ha that had higher levels of HSCRP, such as female sex, BMI above 30, and patients with arthralgia. Next. 
They also performed univariate and multivariate analysis, and higher levels of HSCRP were found to be predictive of developing PSA, both in the unadjusted analysis on top, as well as in the adjusted analysis on the bottom. They adjusted for several factors, including sex, disease duration, PASI, pain score, and many others. So in both analysis, higher baseline HSCRP or associated progression. Next. So as I mentioned in conclusion, higher levels of baseline HSCRP in psoriasis patients were associated with higher risk of developing PSA in the future. Next. Now, the third abstract moves on to a topic of interest for GRAPA and many other organizations currently, which is how to define difficult to treat PSA patients. This paper, uh, this abstract was presented by Cecile Filippotto, in which they defined difficult to treat patients and compared them to non difficult to treat patients. So difficult to treat was defined as failure to two or more biological DS demands with different mechanisms of action, while very difficult to treat was that failure within a time frame of less than two years. They had a retrospective observational cohort that in which they screened 361 patients and were able to include 150 patients with PSA. Of those, 49 were categorized as difficult to treat, 17 of those 49 as very difficult to treat, and 101 as non-difficult to treat PSA. Next. Regarding first difficult to treat versus non-difficult to treat, there were no differences according regarding baseline patient characteristics such as sex, age, BMI, disease duration, and smoking status. Next. Regarding the characteristics of the PSA itself, patients that were difficult to treat had a higher prevalence of axial involvement and of structural damage. Next. There were no difference regarding comorbidities though, uh, such as diabetes, fibromyalgia, depression, and others, which can be counterintuitive as many of the could expect to have more fibromyalgia and or depression in the difficult to treat cohort. Next. They also performed a multivariate analysis, comparing factors that were associated with difficult to treat. And in this analysis, they found that structural damage at baseline, both axial and or peripheral, and biological DMR discontinuation due to poor dermatological control were associated with difficult to treat cohort. In this case, in particular, uh, treatment discontinuation was due to poor skin control in 40% of the patients in the difficult to treat versus 19% of the patients in the non-difficult to treat, which is a very stark difference. Next. Now moving on to the very difficult to treat, these patients had a shorter disease duration with a mean of eight years versus 18 years in the non-difficult to treat. And they also had a higher prevalence of axial involvement and peripheral structural damage at baseline. Next. Regarding those other parameters, the very difficult to treat patients had a higher prevalence of obesity, although there was no higher prevalence of the other comorbidities. And they were more prone to start biological therapy without a previous trial of conventional synthetic DMARDs, the, the non difficult to treat cohort. Next. So in conclusion, difficult to treat and very difficult to treat patients are associated with a higher prevalence of axial disease and peripheral structural damage at baseline. Although in the abstract and the presentation, they did not specify how they diagnosed axial disease. These are one of the conclusions. Poor dermatological control was associated with difficult to treat and very difficult to treat. And there were no differences regarding comorbidities except for obesity that was more prevalent in the very difficult to treat population. Next. 
to finalize, I'm going to present another abstract that Dr. Adder presented at ACR, which is about the treatment responses according to sex. Next. The rationale for this systematic review and meta-analysis was that males and females present different lit baseline, as you can see with different symptoms and inflammatory markers. Next. And that they also respond different treatment in observational studies using TNFI inhibitors, in which female patients had a lower chance of achieving remission and also had a higher likelihood of early treatment discontinuation. Next. So to better study those differences, this group conducted a systematic review and made analysis where they searched Medline, Embase, Central Databases, Abstract Archives, and FDA drug applications from 2000 to 2022, and were able to include 54 randomized clinical trials with about 22,500 patients, of those 50% being female. A main limitation of this review, as any other, is that they rely on the studies that they included. So only 17% of those trials reported baseline characteristics by sex. A third reported some study endpoint by sex, and only a minority reported safe data by sex. Regarding the patient characteristics at baseline, as other studies showed, this meta-analysis also showed that uh, female patients had a higher tender joint count, worse physician goal, global assessment, patient global assessment, higher pain score, and HECDI at baseline, while male patients had higher PASI and CRP. Next. Now moving on to the treatment responses, female patients had were less likely to achieve ACR20 response across all biological DMARDs with no sex differences regarding JAK or TIC2 inhibitors. The same, uh, the same results were found also for ACR50. Next. When analyzing minimal disease activity, female patients were also less likely to achieve MDA across all drug classes, in this case, also including JAK inhibitors. Next. So in conclusion, although most studies do not present sex disaggregated data, there are clear sex differences at baseline and at follow-up, with female patients being less favorable to response to all advanced therapies, although those differences seem less pronounced with JAK and TIC2 inhibitors. Next. So just to summarize, as key findings, there are several factors that are associated with the progression rise to PSA, such as longer disease duration, higher levels of HSURP at baseline, and sonographic subclinical inflammation. Difficult to treat PSA is a new concept that is still under development. It seems to be associated with axon involvement, peripheral structural damage, and treatment failure due to poor dermatological control. And very difficult to treat seems to be associated with obesity. And finally, males and female patients present different at baseline and also respond different to advanced therapies, with females responding less favorably to all treatment modalities. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Andre. Those were wonderful uh, abstracts and, and very clearly described. Um, so I'll open up with one question. And then I, I'll open it up for the rest to bring other questions. But I'm curious about the definition of a treatment failure in the definition of difficult to treat PSA. So it is, I'm looking at the slide again. So it says failure to two or more treatments, right? So how did they define failure? How do you find that a patient is failing a mechanism of action in this study? Do we know that or did you not describe that? In both in the abstract and the oral presentation, they were not very clear about how they defined failure. Uh, she mentioned that the paper was already accepted for submission, so I anticipate that we'll be able to know more. Right. 
published. So I'll shift my question then to Fabian, who I know who's very interested in this topic, if you have any thoughts about that. <laughs> and I also see Enrique link, lifting his hand. So I'll, give, I'll hand it over to you, Fabian, and then you can link to Enrique if you want. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, great presentation, Andre. Thanks for sharing this. And I um, actually think this is what we also have to acknowledge when discussing this abstract is the retrospective uh, analysis they did, right? So this is also um, when I'm seeing the numbers of fibromyalgia in this cohort of 150 patients, I think only two were diagnosed having fibromyalgia. Um, I think this is something that we see differently in our clinical routine, especially in those patients not responding well to therapy. And therefore, I think it's really important to have in mind that it was only um, yeah, patient chart data retrospectively collected. So there are definitely some missings and some uh, things that we don't know about this cohort. Um, but also, I think that this First, we we have seen this also in the in the meta analysis because I think when looking at both ACR fifty or um, DAPSA or MDA response, we see that yeah, a relevant number of our patients are not reaching the treatment targets that we are aiming for, and I think it's really important to try to define better and distinguish better which of our patients are most likely not responding well to therapy and maybe uh, also considering to have different modes of action um, trying um, yeah, to, to target this aspect in this patient population. Enrique, uh, we see that you had your hand up. Uh, really looking forward to hear your expert opinion as well. Yeah, thank you. But I'm a great presentation, Andre. I'm, I'm going to move to another after. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> but that is... Uh, related to the first abstract, the one from Rodrigo. Uh, two, two things there. First, um, I, I did not uh, catch whether the family history was family history of psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, that was one point. And the second one is that this patient had arthralgia. So if you have a patient with arthralgia and then you find uh, synovitis in the ultrasound, don't you, do you not think that the patient might already have psoriatic arthritis and exactly. perhaps the uh, one that is doing the assessment didn't find the wall and joints? So what's your thoughts related uh, to that? Very briefly, the first one, psoriasis, family history of psoriasis. Sorry if I mispronounced before. Uh, the second one is uh, one of the $1 million questions of uh, our current panorama of how to diagnose this. So the current definition would be that our fraud to be diagnosed as PSA should also require synovitis, which means clinical swollen joint, in addition to the imaging finding. Uh, that's how the last EULAR points to consider was also proposed. I find that this is a very open to discussion kind of topic. If there is a clinical history in favor of PSA in a patient that has arthralgia and only subclinical findings, I would tend to diagnose as PSA already. But that's very, uh, I think there's no consensus already regarding this. But in my approach, I would, if there's a significant clinical history with only subclinical findings, I would already diagnose PSA. But that's okay. maybe because I'm a germ, I want to ask again, but. If you have arthralgia, is it subclinical? Isn't that already a clinical manifestation? Um, we most papers write as subclinical if you don't have the swollen joint associated. The swollen is the changing. Well, the, the bottom line is that at the dermatology office, the patient would not have undergone a very specific clinical examination for the joints. So you really don't know if it's subclinical. True. I, <clears throat> Got it. It's I agree because with it's Enrique only self-reported. Synovitis and Doppler signal on, a, on an ultrasound, I would not consider this subclinical. I would say I missed it. I but, would but say I that this person already has arthritis. So... But but recognizing that the that this is done in a room in a in a dermatology clinic, and we know from previous studies 
that about so anywhere from 30 to 80% of patients in a dermatology clinic have been diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis when they were reviewed by a rheumatologist. So there's a, a German study that was done in 2009 where 80% of the patients were found to have psoriatic arthritis and didn't know about it. And there is an international study that Philip Meese was the lead author on where 30% of the patients were found to have psoriatic arthritis once they were assessed by a rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. So the important thing to appreciate also is that Lee Eder actually published from our prospective study that arthralgias, and we know that the patients did not have clinical synovitis when, when we saw them in the clinic, the, the patients that complained of nonspecific joint pain that was not that we couldn't identify any inflammation in any particular joint, those are the ones that were more likely to develop psoriatic arthritis. So if a patient with psoriasis has joint pain, they need to be seen by a rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. They may or may not have psoriatic arthritis. Some of them may end up having osteoarthritis or gout or rheumatoid arthritis, but at least they need to be assessed. I do fully agree. This brings us to another point, Daphne, because I think here then the resources, at least here in Germany, um, it's hard to see all PSL patients with arthralgia by a rheumatologist. I think this is something that we have to acknowledge in this case. And because I had the same thought like you, Enrique, because for me, a patient with arthralgia and psoriasis and having signs of inflammation by ultrasound would also be per se diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis from 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 me but i think um it also really encourages us that our clinical examination is good but not as good as high sensitivity um, ultrasound because it also shows on the long-term perspective that those patients that are having signs of inflammation by ultrasound will develop clinical um, arthritis and antisitis uh, after one year of follow-up. So I think that really um, gives us the yeah, encouragement that we need to use ultrasound in our daily clinical practice to identify those of high risk of developing clinical signs of uh, psoriatic arthritis as well, right? And as I have right. seen that we have also some pay, uh, people from pharmaceutical industries, I think I'm um, coming to the last hot topic about gender differences. It's so utterly important because, I, Andre, you have the numbers uh, by heart, but I think only 17% of the um, studies were uh, even reporting gender differences. And I think this is something we need to look at it because when we are not assessing it, we will not even see the differences, right? I think this is so important that all of us that are doing studies and to the pharmaceutical companies that in the nearer future, we are reporting those differences in the baseline characteristics of the patients because if we are not looking at it, we will not see the differences, right? Yeah, of course. Like, definitely needs to be more uh, presented as more often as disaggregated data. It's like not that complicated to do, so it just needs to be organized from the beginning of the study. But all the information will be there. Enrique, do you have another thing to add? Because I saw your hand up just recently. No, no, no. I just want to um, follow in the first discussion that um, the incidence rate of psoriatic arthritis in that group was extremely high. It was around 30% per 100 patient years, that even in patients at high risk of developing psoriatic arthritis is Maybe just very briefly before we move on, Chris, what is your perspective? I know that you have on uh, many of those clinical topics, you have a very strong perspective, but maybe you can share uh, your perspective as a patient um, with PSA with us on the difficult to treat, difficult to manage, complex to manage, but also on the um, yeah, developing and the ultrasound. How, how have you been diagnosed? Was ultrasound the case or was it uh, mainly clinically? So what, what we do is we take patients with, we screen psoriasis patients without musculoskeletal features with ultrasound. So anyone that had arthralgia, as Daphna mentioned, I put in the chat, 
as Lee, Lee Eater showed several years ago, those are patients at pretty high risk to go on to develop PSA. So uh, we we really focus on those psoriasis patients without those any arthralgias to identify the high risk patient with ultrasound. And it's not just power Doppler. In fact, most patients don't have a power Doppler signal that's more grayscale. And then you have to look at structural damage versus enthesitis. And age is a real factor here. And we presented at the at this meeting that the older, as you would expect, patients get. Uh, they're going to have more structural features. And whether those structural features represent risk factors for PSA is something we're, we're going to find out. Um, you know, in terms of the difficult to treat, I have very strong feelings about the difficult to treat. Uh, we reviewed this at the meeting extensively, myself and Leahy and Alexis and Jose. Uh, and, and that is, it's complicated, right? I mean, you've got patients they're difficult to treat. Is it because of the rheumatologist is not giving the drug enough time to work? Is it because they're not really addressing some of the domains that should be treated? And that was pointed out in the one study where psoriasis was a major variable for difficult to treat. Moreover, in our, in our country, I don't know about Europe, but in the EPIC database, patients can read their own notes. And I, I see this difficult to treat being labeled on a patient as causing merry, great distress for them and causing problems in, 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 the, in the practice. So we've talked to some of our European colleagues about maybe difficult to manage, but even that, I, I'm concerned that we're labeling patients and that might be a problem. The bottom line is we have to get better at early diagnosis. We have to get better at treating the comorbidities and we have to have better understanding of the basic uh, science underlying the skin and joint disease. And we're all working at all of that, but I'm really concerned about labeling our patients as difficult to treat. That's my perspective. <laughs> and um, uh, Fabian, if I, if I may. Yes, please go ahead. I, I agree with Chris. Um, the label is challenging, right? And I think that that label should be one that allows patients to realize they should be open to making changes in either management or therapies. They should be willing to listen to alternative options. They should realize that the physician is really working on their behalf to try to find the right therapy for them so they can get the best response, right? And so how we, what terminology we use is gonna be really important for patients to be open as opposed to being closed and be concerned that they have a label now and that they're sort of fighting the system as opposed to embracing the system and, and what's there. Um, I, I find this data fascinating. I was diagnosed back when there were no options, right? Very limited options, very limited classes of therapies. Um, and so um, I do find the data coming out of Toronto really interesting, right, in terms of what it took for progression and family history. And so for me, the, the family history that I didn't realize I had, the number of years that I had had mild psoriasis and um, ultrasound wasn't really being used then. I was sent for an MRI and I had uh, was diagnosed as a sprained ankle because I had so much inflammation around my ankle. Um, those were all obviously signs now that we could say, wow, you know, that's probably a, a good sign for what's going on. Um, I'm a female, right? I, I see this data about, you know, females being difficult to treat. Um, I, I do wonder what that means for us. I'm not sure I've seen enough data to be solid on that, that, that women are potentially more difficult to treat than men. Um, there could be so many other factors that are that are built into that. But I wanted to comment on the paper with high sensitive CRP. A lot of rheumatologists use CRP as a measure when they see that you have inflammation. And we know that in psoriatic arthritis, CRP doesn't change like it does in rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory conditions. And I do wonder if a high sensitive CRP in clinical practice would be more useful for looking at flares and other things where patients are coming in saying they have, they're feeling worse and they're getting worse, but their CRP isn't changing. And that number and that marker is used so much in rheumatoid arthritis that I feel that sometimes when it comes back normal in a PSA patient, your um, disease is somewhat um, undervalued in terms of what that um, 
flare or start of a flare might be for a patient because things are a little bit more subtle. So uh, that's that was something that kind of intrigued me. So CRP is elevated only in about half the patients with psoriatic arthritis, and it's only a marker when it's elevated. And what the study showed was that in those patients with psoriasis, an elevated CRP is actually a risk factor or a predictor for the development of psoriatic arthritis. I want to make one comment about the difficult to treat. There is currently a GRAPA effort to try and define this better. At the moment, although we say one drug, two drug, two drugs, um, the, the, the issue of what do we consider non-response is going to be a, a question as well. Are we talking uh, minimal disease activity? Are we talking ACR20 achievement? So those things are hopefully going to be sorted out over the next year or so through the GRAPA effort. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the great discussion. I really enjoyed it. And I hope that we are having time at the end to come back for some of those cases. And we heard already there was a bridge with the meta-analysis about uh, sex and gender differences from RCTs. And I'm really looking forward to um, the presentation about the treatment highlights from ACR. And it's Zeni Stavre, uh, assistant professor from Massachusetts, um, that presents uh, now the highlights from treatment on PSA. I was um, preparing the presentation under supervision from Enrique Seriano. Um, Zeni, the stage is yours, and we are really much looking forward to your presentation. And again, thank you, Andre and uh, Daphna, for the great presentation. And as you have seen, the, the discussion was really lively, and I think this is always a really great feedback. So, Zeni, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Fabian, for the introduction. Um, also, thank you to Dr. Soriano for the valuable feedback for this um, uh, abstract selection, um, and thank you for the opportunity to give back to the GRAPA community. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed ACR this year because I attended some of the adjacent GRAPA meetings. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we have no disclosures. Um, so the first um, study I'd like to highlight uh, or discuss is not necessarily a new treatment modality, but just uh, it has an interesting conclusion that requires, I think, uh, more discussion. This was an abstract that was presented by Dr. Maria Antonieta D'Agostino during one of the psoriatic arthritis poster sessions. And it was based on the ultimate study, which was a study that was published, a phase three that was published in 2022 that showed that uh, through ultrasound that IL-17 inhibition with segokinumab leads to a rapid and significant reduction of synovitis in psoriatic arthritis patients. Um, this current study um, aimed to look at and compare ultrasound detected enthesitis versus clinical enthesitis over time. Um, so I think it's an important spinoff uh, from just assessment of synovitis, um, uh, considering enthesitis is a key feature of, of psoriatic arthritis as well. Um, so just the, as a summary, this was a 52-week uh, study with a 12-week double-blind placebo-controlled uh, period. 12-week uh, open-label treatment period and a six-month extension period. Um, patients had to have um, active psoriatic arthritis. They had had prior use of conventional synthetic DMARDs, were biologic naive. They had to have ultrasound-detected synovitis, and they had to have clinical um, enthesitis based on the SPARC index of at least one uh, or greater than one. And they were randomized to receive um, segokinumab 300 or, or 150 based on their um, severity of skin psoriasis um, or placebo. And then placebo patients were switched at 12 week to uh, open label segokinumab. So next slide. So when looking at um, enthesitis through ultrasound, um, they did a couple of assessments. So they looked at power Doppler performed um, bilaterally at uh, and thesis pairs. Um, they also looked, uh, defined uh, uh, enthesitis score with two different definitions, definition one and definition two, uh, just to see if there were differences uh, or correlations with the clinical um, uh, spark enthesitis index. So um, I'm not an ultrasound expert, but um, the definition one included a sum of B-mode morphological abnormalities and uh, power Doppler vascularization abnormalities. 
uh, whereas definition two focused only on power doppler signal alone. And then, as I said before, the clinical response was assessed by the SPARC um, uh, Enthesitis Index score. So in this uh, figure, um, they were looking at uh, percent uh, of patients with resolution of enthesitis based on these three different um, um, criteria or ways of looking at enthesitis. So OMERACT uh, definition one ultrasound, OMERACT definition two, and then the SPARC clinical enthesitis. Um, and this shows that um, the proportion of patients with ultrasound detected and clinical enthesitis decreased for mo most enthesitis sites in both treatment groups from baseline um, and remained stable uh, up to week 52. Um, so here, uh, cyclokinemab uh, treated patients are in dark blue, placebo in gray, and then uh, patients that were switched from placebo to cyclokinemab are in light blue. Um, and uh, if you see, they and the authors also mentioned this, it looked like the SPARC um, index was more closely related to the uh, OMERAC definition two ultrasound. Um, but then go to the next slide. Then they looked, they actually did a correlation um, study. So they looked at correlation efficient between the SPARC index, the clinical enthesitis versus the two ultrasound enthesitis definitions, definition one and definition two. And um, interestingly, they did not find a correlation with these correlation coefficients being very close to zero uh, between all groups. Um, so the authors hypothesized that this is likely because ultrasound assesses inflammation based on morphological uh, functional tissue changes, while the SPARC index evaluates inflammation based on tenderness of the enthesial site. So I think um, this is an interesting conclusion you know, before you go on. And I think it leaves room for more questions and more research um, in the use of ultrasound um, and clinical scoring systems to evaluate enthesis uh, or enthesitis and psoriatic arthritis. And I think it opens up the discussion and the specific role of ultrasound and detection of enthesitis, um, either early versus late or over long-term treatment. Um, so we can move on. So the next study, uh, I'd like to highlight is the foremost stu study. This was presented by Dr. Mies um, uh, in the psoriatic arthritis treatment two abstract session. And this highlighted the use of a premolast, um, an oral PD-4 inhibitor in early psoriatic arthritis treatment. So um, this was a phase four multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. Um, the, uh, I think the novelty of this study was that it included um, early psoriatic arthritis disease patients. So these were defined uh, as patients with a duration, psoriatic arthritis duration of less than or equal to five years, but the actual enrolled population had an average uh, psoriatic arthritis diagnosis of about 10 months. So it was pretty early in disease. They also were patients that had oligoarticular disease versus polyarticular. So they were defined as having greater than one or less than or equal to four tender joints um, and greater than one, uh, but less than or equal to four swollen joint counts. Um, it, with this definition, they, were, they did also capture some um, patients that had more than four uh, total joints involved. So they could have uh, four tender joints, one swollen joint that were separate. Um, and they did an analysis both of those patients with a total of four joints involved um, and then a, a, an exploratory, a, exploratory analysis for all joints involved. Um, but in the subsequent figures, I have removed the uh, all joints involved for simplicity and due to time constraints. Um, it should be noted, however, that the clinical characteristics between the patients that had less than or equal to four joints and greater than four joints involved at baseline were pretty similar. Um, and the majority of patients, about 87% of patients enrolled, had less than or equal to four active joints at baseline. So if we can go on to the next. So um, they defined sentinel joints as the joints that were involved at baseline, and then they followed these through week 16. And this is the result that we're seeing here. So the primary endpoint is achievement of minimal disease activity. Um, and as can be seen here in the premolast treated group, they were, there was a higher percentage of patients that achieved uh, the minimal disease activity. Um, similar is true for the secondary endpoints that they looked at uh, CDAP star remission, low disease activity, and the past as uh, good to moderate response. Um, and you see a higher percentage of patients achieving this uh, with the premolast. 
Um, and then if we could move on to the next. So um, as can be expected, these are patients that have very few joints involved at uh, uh, presentation, and they will eventually develop uh, possibly more aggressive disease and more joints involved. And so they looked at the progression uh, from baseline uh, to a joint count of greater than four. So was there more joint involvement as time went on between placebo and premolast? And as can be seen here, um, there was an increase in the proportion of patients who switched from a joint count of, to greater than four through week 16 um, among those receiving placebo, but not among those uh, receiving a premolast. Um, and so um, in conclusion, um, and the foremost study is the first global randomized control trial studying early oligoarticular psoriatic arthritis. Uh, it showed that better disease control is achievable with a premolast uh, with twice the MD joint response compared to placebo at 16 weeks. And um, a higher percentage of patients with baseline joint count of less than or equal to four shifted to a jo joint count of greater than four with placebo versus a premolast. And so I think uh, overall, the study highlights a role for a premolast, um, an oral non-biologic in treating early psoriatic arthritis patients, possibly even prior to reaching for biologic therapy um, options. And so we can move on to the next one. So, um, I can go through this quick. This was also presented by Dr. Mies during the psoriatic treatment to abstract session. Um, I uh, like this one because it has a new, um, it, it's an interesting molecular design, even though it's a, it's a, an old inhibitor. So it's an IL-17A uh, inhibitor, Izokibep. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that it is a nanobody. It is about a 10th the size of the monoclonal antibodies. And so it can reach hard to reach tissues, presumably can get closer to enthesiocytes, for example. Um, albumin, it has an albumin binding domain. And so um, this can enhance targeting at sites of inflammation and it extends the plasma half-life of this molecule. Um, so you can move on to the next slide. Um, so just quickly, this was actually presented at uh, last year's ACR up to week 16. I missed it at that time, um, but it is a phase two study. And this time it was, uh, it, it was looking at uh, through week uh, 46 of treatment. It looked at two different doses of um, this uh, small molecule. So it was 80 and 40 milligram doses every two weeks that were uh, administered subcutaneously. Um, and then compared it to placebo. Um, the original placebo arm was switched to 80 milligram every two weeks at week 16. Um, and here uh, we can clearly see efficacy, um, particularly of the 80 milligram dose. So ACR 50 uh, was attained in about 81% of patients, ACR 70 in about 52, if you're looking at the green um, week 46, um, uh, highest dose, which is the 80 milligram, and then PASI 100 was achieved in about 71% of patients. Um, um, they also talked a little bit about safety because this is a fairly new molecule, um, and the most frequent, frequent adverse events were uh, injection site reactions in about 14% of patients, um, nasopharyngitis in about 7%, and headache and back pain in about 5.3%, uh, and no uh, candida or fungal infections were observed from week 16 through week uh, 46. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. So, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> to the enthesis. They also looked at enthesitis resolution. Um, so the um, through the LEADS enthesitis index and through the SPARC enthesitis index, and they showed uh, a very um, high uh, percentage of resolution even at week 16. So 88% with the 80 milligram dose as shown in the green. Um, and then that persisted through week 46. Um, and similarly so with the uh, SPARC enthesitis uh, index, although this showed a higher uh, percentage of patients reaching enthesitis resolution at week 46. Um, and the uh, next phase uh, uh, 2B3 trial will look at uh, 80 milligram dose versus 160 milligram dose. Um, uh, so in terms of conclusions from this study, so it highlighted efficacy of this uh, new molecule, this new nanobody IL-17A inhibitor, um, isokibep, um, at uh, 80 milligram uh, in achieving high levels of disease control. Um, and this molecule also had a, a favorable safety profile consistent with uh, prior approved um, IL-17A inhibitors. We can move on. Um, 
So the next study um, is looking at uh, something, at, at, at also uh, uh, older data, but a new way and uh, looking at pain management and psoriatic arthritis. So um, as we know, pain in psoriatic arthritis is multifactorial, uh, multidimensional, and can be influenced um, through reduction of inflammation, but also by other means, such as a direct analgesic drug effect. And so um, the objective of this uh, analysis of this select PSA1 uh, trial was to assess direct and indirect uh, effects of uh, upadacitinib um, uh, a JAK inhibitor and adalimumab TNF inhibitor versus placebo, um, so effects on pain in patients with psoriatic arthritis. So the original um, select PSA1 uh, trial was a randomized double-blind phase three study uh, that compared uh, these two uh, medications, upadacitinib and adalimumab, um, in patients with PSA who had active disease at baseline and inadequate response with non-biologic DMARDs. Um, these patients were randomized to, to receive obatacitinib at two different doses, 15 and 30 milligram, and then adalimumab at 40 milligram every two weeks. Um, it was originally published in 2021, and it showed that there was a uh, that that a good percentage of patients with psoriatic arthritis um, uh, had a response with both. Um, uh, 15 milligram and 30 milligram of upadacitinib, um, and, and as well as with uh, adalimumab with the 30 milligram dose, but not the 15 milligram dose of upadacitinib being superior to adalimumab. However, because the 30 milligram dose of upadacitinib is not approved for treatment with psoriatic arthritis currently, the subsequent data that was analyzed only included the 15 milligram dose. And um, it should be noted that there were a fairly large number of patients included in this analysis. So there were about 1,281 patients, fairly evenly distributed between the three groups. So upadacitinib had about 429 patients, adalimumab about 429, and then placebo 423. And the baseline characteristics of these patients were pretty well balanced, as, as can be seen in the bottom of this slide, uh, with no differences, no significant differences in terms of um, sex, duration of psoriatic arthritis, um, and others. So um, the um, authors looked at uh, patient global assessment of pain, and they did find that there was a significant difference uh, uh, of pain. So they had improvement of pain with both adalim adalimumab and upadacitinib, with upadacitinib showing slightly um, uh, higher improvement of pain uh, compared to placebo versus adalim adalimumab compared to placebo. Moving on to the next slide. So then they tried to look at different components of what could contribute to a change in pain. And so on the left part of the slide, um, they have defined these uh, based in, in terms of colors and then uh, put them in a graph on the right hand. Um, so they looked at change in CRP uh, in blue. Um, they looked at change in itch uh, in purple, uh, change in total enthesitis count in red, and then dark red cha change in leads enthesitis um, index. And then there was this uh, green area, which was just uh, sort of a direct effect uh, in terms of the change in pain. And so as can be seen on the right-hand side, um, there was a significant um, improvement in pain with both adalimumab and placebo, uh, but there, they, there seems to be um, a higher effect, uh, especially on the green area, which is the direct effect of uh, upadacinib. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide. They also looked at um, uh, pain in terms of improvement in total uh, joint count, uh, 28 at week 16. And here you can see even a greater effect uh, of this uh, green area uh, in the obatacitinib uh, group versus the adalimumab group. And so moving on to the next slide. Um, so in terms of um, uh, conclusions, um, so there's uh, opatacitinib and adalimumab uh, both produce rel rel uh, relevantly higher mean improvements in pain via inflammatory and uh, non-inflammatory mechanisms versus placebo in patients with psoriatic arthritis. Uh, and total effects uh, on pain improvement were numerically greater with opatacitinib versus adalimumab when assessed both through the patient global assessment of pain and the tender joint count. Um, so I think uh, uh, 
a better direct effect uh, on pain from opatacitinib over adalimumab is not specific to psoriatic arthritis. And as I think similar results are also shown in the select compare study with RA with opatacitinib, also showing greater improvement in pain over adalimumab. Um, and it should be noted, and we had a good discussion with um, uh, Dr. Taylor at the ACR, and I can't do it justice, but the JAK kinase um, uh, pathway, the JAK stat pathway, um, has been linked, as we know, to signaling uh, of several inflammatory molecules. So that's one pathway, but it, through which it can uh, in, impact pain. But also, it is important, it has been shown to be important in um, central system related neuroplasticity mechanisms. So the pathway is present at the level of the dorsal root ganglia and spinal cord. Um, and as you can imagine, these um, inhibitors, these JAK inhibitors are smaller molecules and they cross the blood brain barrier and they're probably playing a role in sensitization of nociceptors caused by joint inflammation um, and affecting pain that way. And I think that's it. Zenny, thank you so much for this great presentation and the great overview. I have to agree that I think the ACR was really packed with fascinating uh, data on, on PSA in general, but also on treatment. When looking at the isocubab data from the phase two study, I think we can really look forward to see phase three data and hopefully have this in our clinical um, armamentarium in the near future. Um, and also to highlight the the importance of having studies also in oligarticular patients, because I really have to say in my clinical routine to see PSA patients on a frequent, a frequent basis with having more than four swollen joints, this is really rare for me in clinical routine. I mean, this might differ from um, geographical region to region, but to have really data also on uh, oligarticular patients that I can bring back to my clinical uh, decision-making is really important and therefore, I, I'm really fascinated by the um, uh, study results. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, any comments and uh, or clarifications, yeah. Enrique? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sini. That was a great presentation. Great job. Um, I think a, a couple of comments. The first one is uh, probably I like to hear everybody's opinion on this. Um, that um, again, as Sini said, um, the difference between clinical and imaging uh, enthesitis and how we should define enthesitis in the future because there was a discrepancy there and um, I think that the good news perhaps was that the treatment helped both not only the imaging one but the also the um, the clinical uh, aspect but I think that um, in the future we, we should uh, try to define this better because I think that um, there's a lot of discrepancy there and the way we define enthesitis probably is not not um, okay. So um, I, that's my measure. And I think that the pain history is also very interesting because uh, Jack inhibitor have already shown this uh, power to improve pain. So that's uh, very, very uh, important as well. I can only agree uh, very much with you. And I think we had the discussion before uh, as well, Enrique, that I, I also see that just defining antisitis just clinically, what we are assessing at pain at the antigial site is kind of falling short. And this is also opening doors for yeah, misinterpretation. And therefore, I think really to have some more objective signs of um, really inflammation going on at the antesis is really important. And therefore, I yeah, I, I just love the, the the study, the ultimate study design to include the um, yeah, ultrasound assessment uh, and the follow-up and also on the treatment response. Uh, therefore, I, I really enjoyed the presentation as well. And how, how is this going to be in your clinical practice from, uh, yeah, just how are you doing it? Are you assessing um, ultrasound, uh, the antesis, if the patient is having still pain at the antesia site, and how are you doing it if you see structural changes that could have been happened in the past, but now Doppler signal anymore? Is this something that you would see as active antesitis? How, how would, uh, just curious to hear your perspective on this. 
Well, I can give my opinion and then I'll let <laughs> Dr. Soriano uh, give the opinion on this one as well, which is going to be probably much more refined. Um, what I took from that study, what I took away is that there's since there is no correlation between the spark and the ultrasound, that maybe it is a good idea to just do something like the spark index um, or even maybe the, the leads and the in, in score, which is a little easier because it assesses less um, enthesial uh, points. I don't normally do that in clinical practice. I don't follow those scores. I know they're done more often in clinical trials, uh, but maybe I should. Um, and that would be a good way since there is a, there is no correlation and avoid ultrasound. But again, there may be a role of ultrasound, maybe early in disease diagnosis uh, that should not, should not be overlooked. Yeah, I agree with you, Sunny. Uh, I think that we, we do ultrasound in all patients, and uh, and I think that uh, it has already been shown, uh, shown for example, with the Ustekinumab study uh, from Denny McGonagall, that the structural changes uh, usually do not change with treatment, but uh, the inflammation does. So um, I will say that I pay attention to both things, but probably I will not do major changes in the treatment only based on the clinical assessment if there is no um, objective inflammation on the imaging. Um, so that's mainly our approach. We usually do ultrasound, but usually, um, well, uh, Acknowledge that there might be some discrepancies there, but usually do not make great changes if the imaging are not supporting the clinical assessment. And maybe just also again hear your opinion because I was stating that I think the da data from from Isokipep was really fascinating, but having an ACR seventy response of I don't have the numbers by heart, but around. 70 to 80 percent i think this is yeah if this is uh, really being proven also in the larger studies i think this would be just great what is your take on this danny how have you seen the data yeah yeah i agree i, I thought that was fairly high response and pretty impressive um and that and also the psoriasis the posse 100 which uh, can all, usually have more improvement anyways with other uh but yeah it, I think it may be a good drug based on those data if it continues to show the same in phase three trials. And what, what, what was quite funny, because I think that those patients were um, doing first on placebo and then been switched to the 80 milligrams were always doing the best. So maybe there's also an argument to delay the treatment a little with isocupep. No, just kidding. But this was uh, based on the rather small number. It was, it was funny because it was consistent through almost all of the um, outcome measures, when, yep. if, I, if I remember correctly. Yep, I agree. Yes, there was an initial um, enthesitis uh, resolution response that was very high with the placebo switching to 80 milligram and that persisted through the week. So um, yeah, that also indicated that's a good, it's a good drug, but we'll see. I, exactly. I, and I think this is, it was also, um, this was only the uh, 46 week data and the study was terminated earlier because of the promising um, uh, uh, week 16 results. And therefore, I think we, we have to be cautious in interpreting too much into these data. But uh, I think uh, to, yeah, we can really uh, look forward to see the phase three data on the Isaac Pep as well. Great. So does anybody have any other comment? It could be either on these last abstracts presented or even if we want to go back to one of the previous ones, we have four more minutes. So I'll open it up for any other comments or questions about the presentations given today. I have Chris, a you want to say? Uh, Chris I Lindsay? Yeah, you have a comment? Go ahead. Um, it's a question, actually, um, probably yeah. to uh, to the first group of presenters. Um, the rank ligand with the the TNF and the IL seventeen data was interesting, and I guess as a patient, I'd love to ask the question. Um, and maybe Chris, it's to you. Um, is there then potentially a hypothesis that TNF plus IL-17 and psoriasis could potentially prevent the onset of psoriatic arthritis and the, the movement or differentiation of cells? 
and and I probably said that all wrong, but I'm no, just no, no, you didn't say it wrong. I, I, I think that you know there are data that emerge from a number of laboratories that are showing that in the skin, IL seventeen appears to be a major driver along with twenty three. And the joints uh, that uh, TNF maybe uh, play more of a, uh, a role. And uh, this is some data from Kruger's lab. And we found that to be similar when we looked at cytokine levels. So as you know, uh, the idea now of combining biologics is becoming more it's into focus, particularly with the data that emerged from the study on ulcerative colitis, combining gosalcanab and golimumab, showing greater uh, benefit without major side effects. We do know that when you combined uh, an antibody that uh, for IL-17 and TNF, which is the ABV ABT22 study, that um, there was not better response on the ACR20 compared to adalimumab and the, and the bitypical antibody. But uh, what was interesting was that the ACR50 and 70 responses were much higher in the bitypical antibody. So I think that you know targeting two cytokines is a possibility. Whether that will be TNF uh, and IL-17 or 23 and TNF, I don't know. But I think mm -hmm. it's something you're going to see more about moving forward. And our data does clearly show, along with other data, particularly from Pierre Miasek, that TNF and IL-17 are very synergistic at driving a variety of key inflammatory molecules. <clears throat> That was a great question. Thank you, Chris Lindsay, for bringing it up and Dr. Richland for answering back. And I, with that, I think that we got to the end of today's session. So thank you all so much for uh, all the attendees for participating and the wonderful uh, panelists that we had today, both the junior and the senior GREPA members who worked so hard to put this together. It was a pleasure to have you and to hear from you. And thank you, uh, our PRP, Chris Lindsay, for participating also and bringing wonderful questions to Fabian Proft, my co-host, who is always a pleasure to work with. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, sometime in April or late March after the uh, 2024 AAD. So have, I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>